Now we have an hour and there's no way we're going to discuss all about capitalism, what it is and why we want to get rid of it as quickly as possible in an hour. So I thought I would make a series of points to give you some idea of how to look at the question rather than, you know, a big analysis, which is really pointless in a format like this. I think I have to say first that profit is very mystified, everything under capitalism. Everything under capitalism is very mystified, but the first thing is where profit comes from. And profit comes from, first of all, from wages that they give you when you work. No, I, I think. But you always make a lot more for them than they give you back in wages. And that's fundamentally the con. I paid you for an hour. No, you didn't. You paid me for 15 minutes, 45 minutes of the time I was working you took. And that's how profit fundamentally begins. I've written about it at some length. You can read it, it's easy. But we have to know, we have to remember that capitalism is that the technology has gone up enormously to make computers and all the rest, but so has the working day. It hasn't saved us any working time. And that is probably, well, one of the biggest scandals of capitalism because they're telling us that we have to work harder and that we can't retire, we have to work longer, in spite of the fact that we have sacrificed greatly. A lot of people were unemployed, a lot of people suffered in order for technology to be revolutionized. And what has it revolutionized? Not a lot for us. When we get home, if we have any energy left, we have a, some computer and other toys to play with, okay? Two, under capitalism, money has a life of its own. They say the market, the market can't this and the market. Who is the market? I'm not the market, you're not the market. They make it sound like what the, prof what the needs of profit making and money making are is what we all have to bow down to. What it means for human beings is never mentioned. It's not only not central, it's not important. And I want to give you a classic example of why, how this is true. When we go out to work, they say we're workers. When we reproduce the next generation, we're not doing anything important. Now, excuse me. The reproduction of the human race has to be central to any society, but it's not in this society. It's marginal. They're passing the law right now that mothers should go out to work from the time their children are five years old. And who cares what happens to the children? That's not what the society is about. The society is about the market needs it. But our children are not the market. We are not the market. Adults, elderly people, well, we're not producing anymore, so what's the point of taking care of us? I mean, we're just, we're just useless eaters. That's what Hitler called us. And that is, fun. you know, he was capitalism writ large. That's all he was. That's all he was. And when he said useless eaters, he was expressing the view of every capitalist class everywhere. So, you know, you have to, it's not a question of getting rid of money. I'm not talking about that. We're not talking about solutions. We have to know, however, that we cannot be guided by as if things had a life of their own. They don't. We have lives and things must be subordinate to us rather than we subordinate to things. That's capitalism when the things are in charge and the people are hidden behind them. An important part of the way capitalism works is the divisions among us women and men, people of different races, even within the same country, and certainly between nations. They couldn't get us to make war if we weren't divided by nation, you know? And yet, it's all kinds of ways in which we're divided. I want to give you one example. There are 27 occupations in the UK. 
Is that right? 29, 29. There you go, it's already 29. Do you think that this occupation is relating to every occupation in the UK? They're not. You're not. That's a terrible mistake. It's very capitalistic not to be in touch with every single occupation. What they're doing, what they're going through, what they're inventing, we need to know. They're inventing, they're creative, they're doing something. Why don't we know about it? Because we have a capitalist mentality that we have to set, that we have to take charge or take care of or protect this occupation without thinking of the others. Let's get anti-capitalist and make a strong connection with every occupation everywhere. Yeah. Um, okay, number four. Voting is not democracy for all kinds of reasons, that's true. But I just want to say voting is not democracy because the society is divided by different interests. We do not want to live in a society where we have to fight for survival, not when the world can produce enough for everything. There's enough food for nobody to starve. The only thing is most of the world is starving. That's absolutely outrageous, barbaric, the height of violence, the height of racism because it often is people who are not white who are most suffering from the lack of food, but there's no lack of food. Please remember that. It is capitalistic to think in terms of a lack of food. There isn't. It's a lack of people having the money to buy the damn food. And that means that the money is in charge of the lives, and that's capitalism, and we don't want any part of it. So when we vote, we have a choice of these millionaires or these millionaires. Big deal. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't, um, um, they don't differ in their point of view. The Labour Party is as keen on the market as the Tories. The Greens try to do a little something, but they can't break. Nobody has broken with the whole idea and practice and, and values of capitalism. None of them has done that. The occupation is a massive chance. The occupations, the global Occupy movement is a massive chance for us to make that break. You know, you can't discuss whether you're going to stay. You have to stay. It's vital that you stay. You know, you can't, you can't play with that. We need, we need this hub of struggle for our anti-capitalism so that all kinds of people who have very different grievances one from the other but stem from the same source so that we can get together. It's a space for struggle. My God, don't give it up. We need it desperately. And we're not going to vote in anti-capitalism. We can vote in the beginnings. They did in Venezuela and sometimes elsewhere they, they vote. But then once they were in, the anti-capitalists were in, as in Haiti with Aristide, or in Venezuela with um, Chavez, they then had to fight tooth and nail in order to get what they wanted. The population had to stay active and alert, and especially who was active and alert were the women. Well, what else is new? We're always strugglers, and we're always fighters for justice. Every man who has ever been persecuted has six women behind him fighting for his cause. We know that at our women's center. Where is Nikki? Yes, legal action for women can tell you chapter and verse. What I say can be proven. Okay, I just have two brief points. Now, what globalization means is that every nation state is bypassed. So you can do whatever election you like, but you get the market. And it's the same market, and they're in charge everywhere. And don't tell me if I have a plot mentality. If they don't plan, then they're absolute maniacs for killing people. Well, they are anyway. But besides that, you know, globalization has meant that capital has globalized and can bypass or buy 
or by every national government and its opposition. That's what globalization has meant. That's why the global Occupy is so important because it is the hub, the beginnings of a global movement against those who have globalized us, not to bring people together, but to bring the powers that be together, to bring armies together so Israel can spy and kill in Gaza and elsewhere. You know, with the help of the United States and the Russians are not far behind and the Chinese will help or not, as the case may be, but they're never on our side and they have always joined together against the people. Okay, always, with no exceptions. And the final point is that when we try to change the world, they tell us not only we can't, but even if we do, it won't last. Or we are, human nature is against it. Now I want to tell you, I'm a Marxist. And towards the end of his life, Marx, who was the greatest mind that we have known, I mean, there may have been peasants in Japan who had greater mind, but we don't know them. These are the people we know. I'm not saying that just because he's a great mind, he's the only great mind. He's the one we know. He's the one who did the work. He looked at all that the anthropologists at that time, in the middle of the 19th century, were doing, the work that they were doing, and what he found out is absolutely crucial, which is that every human society that they have been able to find everywhere was communist for centuries before class society came. That means it's human nature to be communist, and that's what I am. Thank you. Yes, no, but I just want to answer this because it's a clarification. I'm not suggesting that I go back to living uh, how I can in a cave. This is not my ideal. I want everything that capitalism has enabled us to make because everything that capitalism has, we made for them. Let's make that clear. I want to look at everyone and everybody to be looking at everything and say we want this, we don't want that, we abolish Coca-Cola, it kills children, we don't want this, we don't want fluoridation, we want, the, we want the, the sun to rise and we want the end of uh, nuclear and other powers that are ruining the earth. There are a whole set of things we want and a whole set of things we don't want. Capitalism hasn't made them. It is through capitalism that we have made them and we want them back. That's all I'm saying. When the communist society existed, we had food to eat if there was food. We would like a society where there is not a problem if there is food but that we are not fighting with each other, competing with each other for jobs, housing, medical care. We don't want the pharmaceuticals to poison us with their shit. And a whole set of things, we are constantly at each other's throats. Men and women are not getting on, you must have noticed. This is a crisis. We don't want that crisis. We want to get on, we members of the human race, and we, we members of other species, you know? on the basis of what we have now rejecting and accepting collectively in a society where we as individuals want what the society wants so we're not against our neighbors and we can be true individuals. That's what communism is and that's what communism always has been. We're not talking about the communist party and Stalin and all that crap. But that's beside the point. That was a moment in time that was dreadful. Life expectancy was never any lower than it was during the Industrial Revolution for workers. And we don't count the price that we have paid. If we counted it, we never would have done it. Okay, on um, human, look, I, there isn't time today, and if people are interested, I'll be glad to discuss this in greater depth, given chapter and verse. But you have to know, I'm helping a man with a book now, 
who lived in Tanzania in the 60s, where they made communist society successfully, it was doing brilliantly, but the corrupt officials destroyed it against the will of the president of Tanzania, the great Mwalimu uh, Nyerere. I, I can't go into detail, but if you have, what well, you cannot make communism by legislation in the sense that you can only make communism by a movement that is broad and wide where in the course of making the movement, people change themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That is Marx. No party, no union, no organization is going to do that for us. We have to do that for ourselves collectively. And as we clarify and struggle and demand more power for all of us rather than for six ones who are going to have careers at our expense, we change to make, to be part of, to create, to be able to collectively work in a way that builds a new society. That's the only way to do it, and I'm ready to discuss that in detail with anybody who wants to discuss it. Speak to Nina, and we'll make a date, okay? So that, you know, that is one important thing. In terms of legislation, of one piece of legislation, I would legislate for women to get wages for caring work. Yes. Because that would mean, well, I'll tell you why, not only because I'm a woman, although because I'm a woman I'm smart, <laughs> because we want a society that begins with the reproduction of the human race. on the basis of what's good for us rather than what's good for the market. And if women had that money, if, if, the, if a government could be made to, to give women that money, that's the point. If we organize as women to get, and men to get that money, that means we would already be transforming the standards of the society. I don't want only that women to have money. I want the society to change. And this would be a kind of symbol of this enormous change, which is why the Global Women's Strike says invest in caring, not killing. On the question of this, it, we're not going to get nothing unless we overthrow them. And that wasn't true 30 years ago. I'm not saying it was always true. There were times when we could get changes. We got great changes. We got the National Health Service in this country. We got a welfare state in this country. This was a civilized country, relatively speaking, at least for the people within it, not in relation to foreign policy, not in relation to who they were starving and torturing elsewhere. I'm not going into that. I'm saying we began. We got something. We're not going to get it back now from them because they are insane. They have been driven insane by the enormous quantity of money and wealth which is at their disposal. They cannot think anymore. They are beyond it. They can only be moved aside. And that's why I'm so happy to see the, 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 the outline of an international movement where sectors are getting together. I have to say, you know that Sam spoke, this is my son, that Sam spoke earlier today, and he spoke about an experience that a lot of people don't know about. That's a scandal. Scandalous that people who work A don't know what goes on with people who work B. That's how divided and separated we are. That's why an occupation like this is a lifesaver where we can actually come together and exchange experiences, exchange struggles, and ultimately work stuff out together. And the
point that was made about that they don't create anything. You know, they, here in the occupation, we have one of our principles, one of the nine points in the, in the original statement, is that we don't believe that the cuts are either necessary or inevitable. I think maybe we should add to that, that we don't believe that the 1% are the wealth creators. Because they always put it out like they're the ones who make the money. Yes. And we have to be grateful if they bring that money to our country. And if, they, if we're not good, they'll take it away and go and make jobs somewhere else. Well, in fact, we made all the money. The 99% are the wealth creators. The 1% are the ones who have vacuumed it up. Uh, who was it? Martin Luther King who said like some demonic vacuum cleaner. Yeah. You know, they the just... War, the war industry. Okay. They, yeah. they suck up our lifeblood and everything that we've produced and accumulate it in their own hands and use it against us. And that's capitalism. But I think we have to, you know, when we're challenging the banks, we should ask who are the wealth creators, the 99%. When they said that so few people or a third of the people here were not anti-capitalist, whichever way around it was, most yes. of the people were not anti-capitalist, I think that we have to take that with a pinch of salt because people have been reluctant to identify as anti-capitalists because the uh, established left has so discredited the term and in my experience for people who are involved in practical grassroots struggles the left comes along and says you have to be anti-capitalist behaving like the vanguard you know, behaving like they know better and actually often entangling people in theoretical discussions about capitalism and the nature of capitalism and how bad it is and so that you all feel defeated and immobilized as a way often of sabotaging very lively grassroots struggles. So, I, you know, I think it's yeah, uh, I agree. Well, something to bear in mind. I think there's a lot more anti-capitalism around than we necessarily know about. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Nina wanted me to say something which is really important. In the, in the session before this, uh, Paul, Reverend Paul Nicholson spoke, and he spoke about poverty, and Kay spoke about the uh, welfare reform bill which is now going through Parliament, which is a new version of the poor law. Yes. It's going to have people begging on the street, people with disabilities, people with children. Nobody needs to be unemployed. To Nobody needs to work eight hours or more a day. We can all work a couple of hours a day yes. and have a lot of fun. Yes. What about that? Yes. Now this is very serious and we have serious work that we want to do. We have creative work, we, want, we have work that we want to change the society and build houses for people, but there's a lot of stuff that needs doing, rather than the terrible work that we either do to eight, ten hours a day, or not at all, and then they want to starve us. So it's this moment in time that we must come out, I don't know what you propose, Kay, about what the occupation can do about this terrible film. It's, it, you know, it goes along with the destruction of the, na the National Health Service, where the pharmaceuticals and the GPs who are corrupt will be in charge. We never let that happen before, and this is what they're imposing now, and Labour's not standing up for us, it's no. not. The, the man who said about how you can't have communism and the movement always turns bad and look what's happened in all these different countries. You know, they always tell us that. They always tell us it's pointless, that whatever we do, we're going to be defeated, so why are we doing it? But the fact is that anything good that has ever been achieved in terms of better working conditions, better wages, you know, more time for ourselves, Everything has always come out of people fighting for it. Yes. They've never given us anything. During the Industrial Revolution, it was probably the time when our life was the shortest. Yes. People used to live, what, the average was like 20 years or something. And that's when they were producing all this wonderful technology, which everybody's in awe of. And in fact, a lot of the technology, we don't want it. Yeah. Nobody wants to go back to the cave, obviously, because once you're used to something else, you also want the advantages of what you know. But the 
a lot of the technology is not worth producing. It's just killing us and it has nothing to do with what we want. Like the they just make it because they can make money out of it and they can enslave us in making it like for no other reason whatsoever. And half of it, like the mobile phones, is now coming out how bad they are for children. Yeah. There's more and more stuff coming out about brain cancer and mobile phones, That's right. which they have denied all along. Yeah. And then by the time it comes out, we can't do without them. You know, and that's how they do it every time, with the nuclear plants, the nuclear power, the this and that. It has nothing to do with what we want and what we really need. In fact, our choices most of the time are limited in terms of you can buy this or you can buy that, and most of it is useless. Yes. Wages are dependent on the social wage, okay? and that men's wages are dependent on women's wages and that the fact that women don't have wages very often means that all wages are pulled down. A woman named Eleanor Rathbone, who was the most famous woman in Britain in that generation that you with the white hair will know, who fought and won family allowance for women which was paid in 47 or 48 for the first time. She went to the trade unions and she said, look, when you go out on strike, the family allowance, if we win it, will enable you to stay out without your children starving. And the men had trouble getting their minds around that. The only union who understood was the miners' union understood that if women had money, men were safer, men could be strugglers, men could demand better for themselves and their families. And that connection between the unwaged on the one hand, including the unemployed, and the waged on the other, that connection is never drawn, that connection is hidden. You would think we were different forms of life. <laughs> Whereas in fact we are so intricate, intricately connected. We cannot be separated. I mean at this moment in time, it's terribly important for the movement to acknowledge this and bring the two sectors of the 99% together by acknowledging what each is doing and how each is exploited and how each has been struggling against exploitation. That's the only basis on which we can come together where I'm not helping her and she's not helping me, we're helping each other. Yeah. 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 And that is absolutely crucial that our faith is together because Virginia Woolf said a number of things, including that middle class women should get money so they don't support their husbands who want to make war. That's another question we we'll discuss at another time. She said, as a woman, I have no country. Now that's famous, but the other lines that follow are not. As a woman, I want no country. As a woman, my country is the whole world. And that should be, as a woman, as a man, as a child, as the 99%. Yeah. Yeah.